Welcome to Vets Vault. It's Making Boss Moves Mondays. Trick or treat, you be the judge. Like, share, subscribe, comment, and be sure to hit that notification bell for updates. Today we're talking financial lit and politics. We'll be covering RBG, Donald Trump, Mike Tyson, and Wells Fargo CEO. We're dropping diamonds. Stick around while we unlock the vault. I clutched my pearls when I heard the news that Wells Fargo CEO Charlie Scharf reportedly made a comment that I say is reckless and outrageous, but in all sincerity, he was speaking from his heart. When he said in a statement to his employees by way of a memorandum recently that there is, quote unquote, a very limited pool of black talent to recruit from, end quote. Yes, he has released an apology saying that, and I quote again, it was an insensitive comment reflecting my own unconscious bias, end quote. His behavior leads me to question whether Mr. Scharf made this statement based on ignorance or information. In my letter to the board, I asked, how do we progress from here? I use the term we because my three decades as a customer has earned me the right to be a voice for my community. I went on to share with the board that I think diversity is too broad a term and it takes on a very different meaning when it, you're looking at who's in charge of diversity and managing diversity for the company because the diversity manager is a Caucasian woman at Wells Fargo and based on just, just what I've observed, even in Hollywood, when white women speak of diversity, they're speaking strictly in terms of gender, not necessarily very conscious that race consciousness is also needed in these spaces. I went on to also say that 17 members of their senior, senior leadership team is black. And I wonder how Mr. Scharf's reasoning impacted Mr. Lester Owens, the one black man on the senior leadership team, according to their website. I'm, of course, waiting to hear back. In an op-ed piece on CNN.com, Dr. R Maya Rockamore Cummings, the widow of Maryland Representative Elijah Cummings, who passed away in October 2019, said, and I quote, he was not only concerned about the Republican Party's irreverence, he was deeply disturbed by Trump's erratic and autocratic style of leadership. So much so that by the end of his life, he had determined that Trump was not simply unfit for the position of president, but that he was also an imminent danger to the American people and in our system of government. Elijah quite simply viewed the 2020 election as the bottle, battle for the future of our democracy, end quote. Irreverence is an operative word. The incivility, disrespect, flippancy, and presumption is quite unpalatable. I must add myself. And you can quote me on that. Supremacists never play by the rules. The New York Times has obtained the president's tax return for over the course of two decades, since the years 2018 and 2019. What we've learned is reportedly that Trump's property struggled, he took significant write-offs, and he's undergoing an IRS battle that could cost him $100 million because of a refund he received that was over $90 million. He reportedly only paid $750 in income taxes in 2016 and then again in 2017. Nevertheless, I command and demand that you exercise your right to vote. This right was hard to come by. <laughs> the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which was signed into law by President Lyndon B. Johnson, it aimed to overcome legal barriers at the state and local levels that prevented African Americans from exercising their right to vote as guaranteed under the 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Do not take this opportunity lightly. A week after Bloody Sunday, which occurred on March 15th, 1965, you remember one of the many events that outraged Americans when a peaceful march 
from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama. The marchers were met by Alabama state troopers who attacked them with nightsticks, tear gas, and whips after they refused to turn around. President Johnson delivered a nationwide address in which he declared that, and I quote, all Americans must, must have the privileges of citizenship regardless of race, end quote. He informed the nation that he was sending a new voting rights bill to Congress, and he urged Congress to vote the bill into law. Congress complied, and President Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act of 1965 on August the 6th, 1965. And President, of course, was Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., among other civil rights activists. Rest in Paradise, the notorious RBG. She never stopped believing in a better future for our democracy. With the conservative, her conservative colleagues, she often found herself in the minority. And she, of course, was in the minority when it came to the most recent voting rights case, Shelby County, Alabama, versus Eric Holder, um, Attorney General Eric Holder, who was a, a part of the Obama administration. The case's legal underpinnings um, are worth speaking about. Shelby County filed a lawsuit after one of its small cities, Calera, created a new voting plan and they did not submit it for preclearance. So here's the deal. The Voting Rights Act was put into place um, to ensure that no citizen, black, white, indifferent, illiterate, literate, would have to be subjected to devices like the Mississippi's notorious soap bubble test, which required black voters, voters to correctly guess the number of bubbles in a bar of soap in order to vote. It prohibited discriminatory tests and devices that require jurisdictions to submit any new changes in their voting procedure, closing or moving polling places, requirements for more and more limited forms of identification, reduction in early voting days and purges to voter rolls. Do these sound familiar, Georgia? Hello? I'm speaking to my people here in Georgia. Do these devices sound vaguely familiar? When the act was passed in 1965, it covered jurisdictions, including Alabama, of course, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, South Carolina, and Virginia, 39 counties in North Carolina, and one in Arizona. Additional jurisdictions were added over the years. Well, Chief Justice Roberts found the act unconstitutional and ended the preclearance requirement for the covered states and counties. And he said, and I quote, the blight of racial discrimination in voting that once infected the electoral process in parts of our country for nearly a century, century were over. <laughs> and so the act that was designed to address all of these issues has been ameliorated according to this reporter for the Times. In her dissent, Justice Ginsburg stated, throwing out preclearance when it has worked and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory changes is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you are not getting wet, end quote. She had previously stated, and I quote, the court criticizes Congress for failing to recognize that history did not end in 1965. But the court ignores that what's passed is prologue. She was quoting William Shakespeare, who said, and who those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it, end quote. Politics, trips, and treats aside, I am Mike Tyson at 54 years old announced that he would be voting for the first time in this election. 
This election will be my first time voting. I never thought I could because of my felony record. I'm proud to finally vote. He wrote on Twitter and he encouraged other unregistered voters to sign up to vote. Shout out to Iron Mike Tyson for reaching this feat.